All right, this is your Gaza War sit rep day 167. Um, no end in sight. Oh, I, I we did we were preparing off uh, Mike John, but there was the ceasefire resolution, which uh, was presented by the Americans today, and it's basically we're um, ready to negotiate towards a surrend towards the ceasefire if Hamas surrenders everything first. So yeah, that didn't seem productive. Not a. I mean, we really are. We we've said this about Canadian media being useless. Oh, and like I think we mentioned the Canadian part. I didn't mention the Canadian Parliament little farcical little exercise they did as well. But um, nothing nothing useful comes out of these these bodies at all. Um, so yeah. However, the the big we have lots of big stories to cover today. Um, I think the main the main thing, and we might as well start there, is the battle at Al Shifa. So Al Shifa Hospital, the biggest hospital in, I think, in Gaza, it's yep. basically like a gigantic complex hospital, um, and it's uh, the Israelis have come back on day four to commit every imaginable atrocity. They're doing field executions. They're taking people and shooting them four, five, ten at a time. They've blown up one of the wings. They're they're just you know it's it, I I can't even it's unimaginable. I don't even know how to talk about it or think about it to to come back and do it all again. Yeah, um, I think it's the worst thing that we've seen, and it's it's incredible. It's unbelievable. But and this uh, time, this time, Kassam defended the hospital. Yeah. So this time we have seen uh, Israel setting up very calmly to go in and c commit leisurely commit atrocities and take their pictures and do their TikToks and everything. And now um, they're finding, we've seen field reports and videos of yeah. snipers getting, Israeli snipers getting killed by uh, Al by resistance snipers. We're seeing uh, tanks getting blown up by uh, resistance RPGs. We're seeing reports of mortar shells against their Israeli position. So they're, they, you know, they came in to set up to do what they did last time. That's what it looks and, like. And scale it up. And they got um, more blown up. They... The, the, a number of those tanks, at least six strikes on camera. Right. Um, and and a, a, at least a couple of them, the one in particular that I posted uh, today, uh, for sure, the crew, the commander, the driver, the way that it hit the turret. I, I don't think there's any other way. So we'll we'll be able to track casualty reports again to see if uh, and and that Israel was the one. Can... I think the one you re, re, you put up today. The the guy who fired the uh, grenade said, "Call the tow truck." Oh yeah, yeah. That was yesterday. That was actually that one. I think that was in uh, Zahra again. That was in the northwest corner of the middle camps area um yeah and fighters used we saw two times in zahra fighters using the same tunnel to attack armored vehicles from the same shooting position in a tunnel and the one yesterday that they posted the guy is clearly talking to multiple people down in the tunnel when he comes down and he says like hey boys <laughs> call the tow truck it's yeah. remarkable, uh, remarkable footage. Um, and even just like the details in that footage, like Kassam is using in that one, a Yassin with a tandem 85, which is smaller than the Yassin 105, but is actually taking their old um, warheads, the single charge warheads, and Kassam added a second charge to make them a tandem charge. So effectively taking these weapons that would otherwise be obsolete because the armor, the Israeli armor has thickened so much in the years since that warhead was created, um, instead of wasting or not having unusable munitions, um, they re they reworked all the shells into a tandem shell. So that footage, we're seeing them use the same tunnel multiple times. We're seeing them talk to clearly a unit of fighters that are in the tunnel. Uh, absolutely legendary quote to to say to the to the guys in the tunnel, using a weapon that is just ingeniously um, 
uh, you know, created thought to and, think th think about it that way. And, and and it's not a it's not a it's not a choose your battles. It's like the the Israelis came to them and they were setting up in Al Shifa. So this is it, the the fact that they're able to contest Al Shifa to me is such a big deal. Yeah, it's, it's, it's I mean it's something that deal. we have kind of talked about off air for yeah. for the last six months or five months of the ground wars is, is because it's an impossible situation for the resistance. What are they supposed to do? Are they supposed to defend the hospitals? Should the resistance have built their defenses uh, expecting that the only military objective besides destruction that the Israelis would want to achieve was literally dismantling the healthcare system in Gaza? Nobody, nobody thought that, nobody was that depraved to think that way. Um, but but when we watched what happened in these hospitals, you you watch and think that, that these have to be defended. We this can't yeah. you can't just let them go hospital to hospital and massacre people by these quadcopters that they're using to shoot anyone that comes and goes from the hospital. Brutal massacres at each of these hospitals as they emptied them out. But what we're seeing now in Shifa is a, a heroic battle but also just appalling atrocities that are, um, yeah, that make this it's an impossible situation. Do you defend the, the territory um, and, and, and Israel massacres what looks like right. it will end up being hundreds of people? Um, or, or do you allow them to, to do what you described at the beginning, a lot leisurely stroll into photo ops um, and leaving, because the key is that they've left each of these hospitals non-functioning when yeah. they leave. They're not just taking a photo op um, and then leaving. They're not even just going in and clearing the hospital and allowing the hospital to function in some way. They're dismantling the hospital. And that that objective has followed each of these raids. It's yeah. it's a it's appalling. But, but there's no point for the resistance in letting it happen anymore. You can and, see no, there's and no... it can't happen with these localized raids now that yeah. it's not a, a Gaza wide ground war. Now yeah. that it's it's it, like targeted raids carried out from these buffer zones into the urban areas. I think these urban um, incursions will have to be resisted and and i think you know history will t will, will say that that they heroically fought um you know a mechanized genocide that the entire world is watching be live streamed hour by hour the last 48 hours are have been unbelievable like we're speechless about it. I don't even know what we can say at this point about it. It's clear that the entire command and control structure of the Israeli army is allowing this to happen. There's no accountability in the chain of command at all. That's that's ludicrous. But not only that, but they're clearly okaying the massacre of civilians that are easily identified as civilians. Because even if you were to say like a fighter who's in a hospital bed is not a legitimate target. That's not that that is a war crime. If they are. But what they're what they're the doing is massacring people outside in the halls, in the surgery ward, on the streets outside and around it. It's it's clearly that they're able that their entire chain of command is allowing, not only allowing ordering. It looks to be I just can't see how it could be any other way at this point. That drone footage, Al Jazeera released drone footage um, from the Israelis, just clearly watching them. It was from early February in Khan Yunus, but it could have been anywhere at any point. And it's just Israeli drones watching five men walking back to their homes, clearly civilians, tracking them over the course of multiple kilometers, clearly nothing in their hands, not carrying any bags, just clearly being civilians um, and just being wiped out. And that's just because we have footage of that. We it's happening. We have footage of that because the resistance shot down that drone, I think. Is that where it came from? I didn't I actually so. see the root of that. I think we have that footage because the resistance 
either shot it down or however it is that they managed to acquire these drones. They seem to acquire them I actually them didn't fully know that there intact. was that angle. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I don't think it came from the Israelis. Uh, but the so, is, but the Israelis are are also publishing it. The Israelis are are the ones that we know about these executions because the Israelis are filming them loading up trucks full of people in wearing like hazmat suits because I get I don't I don't know where the hazmat suits came from. These white jumpers they're put in with like white over I don't even know what you call them. They look like hazmat suits. Um, giving people instead of having them stripped naked but they're uh well, this they is that the, too yeah. yeah this footage this footage will be recorded yeah i mean we keep saying for generations to come i don't know if we'll all assuming, be around yeah, here assuming we have them yeah i mean i remember the, the the thought i had today probably should save it for tanky therapy but i thought i, I was remembering how putin you know when they were threatening russia with nuclear war and Putin sort of said, you know, we're willing to use nuclear weapons if there's a threat to Russia. And he said something like, you know, we don't really see a point in there being a world without Russia. That was kind of his quote. And I was just thinking, like, I don't I don't know. Sometimes I don't know if there's a point in a world where this is allowed to happen. Like, what? why, you know, what if if a world order can't stop this from happening, then what? What good is it? I don't know. Maybe we should, maybe we should give it to the next species in line: jellyfish or cockroaches. Or it's or it's truly appalling what we're seeing. Um, and the just just to say though the the determination, uh, and just no matter yeah. how many months this goes on, every time there's a bombing. There's scores of Palestinians with their bare hands on the scene, helping people out. Um, the the way that the 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 medical staff at Shifa have, have handled this, and the way the neighbors, you know, that because the the whole neighborhood's been besieged and attacked. Yeah. Um, I, I yeah. The, and that's the thing: the fighting the Israelis are setting up to attack Shifa from the neighborhood. And that's where a lot of the fight, they call it, you know, when the, the field reports are saying from the vicinity of Al Shifa. So they're generally, they're not like fighting at the hospital. They're fighting all around the hospital where the Israelis are, have their various headquarters, staging areas. Yeah, they, they're fighting in the blocks around Shifa. And just for people, just to understand, Shifa is, it is, it's a large hospital, it's a large campus, but it's also like a landmark in the city. The whole campus takes up a, a, a whole massive city block in a place where there isn't parks and mm -hmm. open space. And um, so it really is, in, in some cases, it, it it could be described as attacking the heart of Gaza city. Right. And that it's representative of that. Um, people who lived around the hospital, um, you know, stayed some, a lot If people stayed, they stayed in that area um, because that's where there's anything um, at all. Right. Like the North has been so brutal. Um, so it's really a landmark. It's symbolic, and and that's what I say is like history will record this, that that this is a genocide, and that this is the most appalling things we've seen so um, in generations, yeah. but that the resistance is is heroic in the face of that, and and that that that's that's not nothing, um, and and oh. the footage today um, was incredible, and even there was even a video. Um, by Islamic Jihad today, where they, they like gave a shout out to the Janine brigades because there's mm -hmm. been, I guess we'll get to later in the show, a lot going yeah. on the West Bank as well, and so the wow. resistance in their tunnels, they showed a a, a tunnel unit, a Sarail Quds tunnel unit, and they're saluting the resistance in Janine, which yesterday suffered like within 24 hours, less than 24 hours of the video being published, was the. Uh, assassination in Janine. And so you got fighters in Gaza shouting out 
the resistance that experienced that within 24 hours in the West Bank. They're shouting out the resistance um, from Hezbollah in the north. Um, obviously, they're they're constantly shouting out Ansar Allah and the resistance from Yemen. Um, and so you can see the way that they're still communicating, the way that they're, they're very aware of what's going on. Um, there's nothing that's showing anything like the... Um, there's no military accomplishments for Israel. And you could just see in these moments, like the North was quiet uh, for, in, in some ways it's been quiet for months. Um, but the second the Israelis moved in to Shifa, um, we get this, um, you know, this resistance. And previously, the other time that they moved into Gaza City was Zaytun. And we talked about Zaytun for 10 days Um because of the resistance there. So it's just obvious, it's clear that the, and even the Shifa raid, I don't know if you did this on a previous show, but the Shifa raid was an assassination of the uh, head of internal security for Hamas, um, who had, had negotiated the secure passage of the first aid deliveries to the North. And in doing so, had pretty clearly uh, had, allowed a vulnerability to the communications and that's the that's the first intelligence that the israelis have got in this war and it was essentially the hamas security minister facilitating aid communicating with the clans um you know working out a deal but also speaking to international aid organizations and to unra um and to to do the work of uh, an, uh, a municipal government to do its job, that it's still functioning. Um, it's just, and then because of that, because he facilitated that, you can see how it created a vulnerability. Um, and I think that that seems to be a pretty clear line, um, which is difficult sometimes in battle, these battles that are happening, you know, and we're getting pieces of information, but that seems like a very clear um, connection that it, it, Israel is attacking um, the 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 people who are making it possible to deliver flour in Gaza is seen as the threat, and that's what tips off this raid on Shifa Hospital. And because they've been allowed the space to attack hospitals since the Al Alhi Hospital at the beginning, when they said it was an Islamic Jihad rocket, um, five hundred you know, kilogram. Yeah, we've never heard another Islamic jihad rocket hit something, right? We there, that that whole narrative um, just not even relevant for the next hospitals because by the time they got to Rantizi Hospital, like two weeks later or whatever it was, um, they were just straight up sacking the hospitals, and they went into Shifa and sacked Shifa. They took videos of their special forces commander. Um, with their forces pointing guns at the door of the hospital. Um, so they they feel at this point like they can do anything. And that's why it appears to be a whole chain of command thing. Um, well, I mean, like, if they feel like they can do anything except, for example, have their command to face the camera when he makes a video. I'm yeah. sure you saw well, that, that, that yes. Um, that, but... that was a that was an interesting video that, just to say to people they the special should, forces should... unit did you talk about it uh, yeah but you can you can, you can yeah the it. special forces unit that sacked the hospital is a secret unit um they never give their names and they don't usually give their missions but in this case he he gave a speech with the back of his head facing the wall or facing he was in the administration building of the hospital. So they're like essentially in the lobby of the hospital pointing at the surgical department with their guns um, and having this secretive unit be on camera and with his, you know, his fat head is something that you could, when they do see his face, you'll be able to say, oh yeah, that was his, his neck that I saw at the back um, during, you know, one of the most barbaric massacres yeah, uh, but it, but um, the previous guy was 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 taken out by a resistance sniper, right? Um, yeah. I, did you know that I that I broke that story? I right. put those two pieces together back in January. 
But um, yeah, the Al Jazeera got extended footage that really showed how that officer from the Shifa raid, how Qassam targeted the commander mm -hmm. and how they knew, because we didn't know from the video that, 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 that they had been tracking him. And so on Sunday, Al Jazeera released footage, extended footage that Qassam had given them that shows the unit, yeah. the sniper unit, tracking the individual. Um, so and what we successor... saw in the sniper video today from Shifa, mm -hmm. that sniper is carrying out massacres outside yes. of the hospital. Yeah. Um, there's not only fighting, the, not, the only fighting in Gaza is not around Shifa. There was also fighting around Khan Yunus. Um, the Al Quds, Soraya Al Quds says they detonated a tunnel shaft upon the entry of an Israeli force who were attempting to enter the tunnel, resulting in casualties in the Karara area north of Khan Yunus, and engaged in clashes with an IOF force using machine guns at point blank range east of Khan Yunus. So there's fighting in Khan Yunus too, on the edges of Khan Yunus. Yeah, and that's, although they've uh, mostly withdrawn from Khan Yunus, yeah. um. But there was also fighting in the middle camps along um, the buffer zone that the Israelis are attempting to build across the Gaza Strip that I did on the mm -hmm. show yesterday mm -hmm. on the Electronic Intifada live stream that um, I think we're going to see a lot of fighting along that corridor, which we have seen both from the north, from Gaza City attacking south, and from the middle camps attacking north. Um, yeah. But but the the Khan Yunus thing is interesting because the Israelis are pull have pulled mostly out of Khan Yunus, um, and are not in any position right now to invade Rafa, and so we have this multi week what looks like a multi week, many weeks because even if they say they're going into Rafa, we're going to visually see the build up before that invasion that's not happening right now and will take weeks to happen. Um, yeah. And so if there's if this ceasefire proposal from the Americans, the joke that it was, um, is really it's, it's just setting up another multi month period delay. of time here delay, where it just is so clear that the Israelis don't care about getting their people back. Yeah, because they're ready, they, or they're they ready care, to... they care about not getting their people back at this point. Yeah, because they're preparing for something that is multi multi week before it happens and then when it happens the invasion of rafa will be a months long invasion and so to go into rafa without a ceasefire is is assuming you're not even going to bother getting your people back until the end of the battle of rafa which could be months and months so it's really remarkable because this is the window of time that if the israelis were going to flex be flexible to get their people at least the first batch of their people back but they're not they're actually thinking the opposite they would rather go into shifa and 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 assume that a massacre at shifa hospital will lead hamas to surrender um, yeah. which is what it appears by all of the idf communications we've heard um loudspeakers them talking on loudspeakers saying it um, that, that saying we're going to, this is putting pressure on Hamas. This raid on Shifa uh, is to put pressure on Hamas to surrender. Um, so there it's a, yeah. it's a political, it's a terror massacre, right? It's like hard it's to, hard to believe they believe that, but maybe they do. I don't know. Um, we also have. The they stole millions here. of dollars. I don't know if we reported on that. They stole they, $3 million in cash from the hospital. Right. It's yeah, just unbelievable. Yeah. They're the looting and pillaging and sacking. Yeah. Um, they're also using rubble, the rubble of Gaza, to build this pier out to the Americans. So it's getting, it's becoming clearer now, the idea. The idea is for uh Hamas is defeat in their minds Hamas is defeated uh Gaza is occupied militarily and the Israelis sit on the Gaza side of the pier while the Americans send pontoons of 
whatever it is that they're sending. Uh, so I think the there's Israelis actually two things it. happening. The rubble that you're describing is this world central kitchen oh, that's NGO creating oh, a makeshift Warriors. jetty to accept this ridiculous barge that they have and has taken up however many column inches of newspaper coverage. This is another barge. There's a second barge. There's more barges coming. There's so. apparently a second barge has set out, but they used the rubble to create the pier. Mm -hmm. They used the rubble of Gaza. And the rubble of Gaza is a tomb for people's families. And the decision about what to do with the rubble in Gaza is a national decision. It's not the decision of some NGO that's uh, getting an okay by the Israelis to bring a bunch of uh, vehicles in to create a jetty, um, vehicles that aren't allowed in for any other purpose. In fact, vehicles that the Israelis have openly targeted and destroyed, municipal digger vehicles that are necessary, that are part of the ceasefire negotiations, are being used to carry out um, to create a pier with the rubble um, that that ultimately may be the decision that people in Gaza make to use the rubble to make a pier. But that's a decision that people have to make and feel like they have made uh, collectively. Um, unilateral actions with the rubble is just very, um, it's, it's a disturbing development that um, the last time we talked about it, the pier, they were bulldozing a sandbar and that seemed like absurd. Um, but at least it wasn't this deep violation that feels yeah. it, as part of this um, world central kitchen, the, the, which is a itself a joke, right? It's the barge is 12 trucks. Yeah. The Israelis can process 45 trucks an hour at their current staffing. So at starvation as a weapon of war staffing. They can do 45 trucks an hour. The barge takes multiple days uh, yeah, to bring 12 trucks. Practical. So that's that's a deeply disturbing thing. We actually don't know yet where the Americans are going to put their temporary pier. I argued on the Electronic Intifada live stream that the, 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 the positioning of that pier only really makes sense in this one buffer zone along the center of Gaza. Um, because in the north, I, d I don't think they can secure. I don't know. I, I mean, the Americans are literally they're sailing across the Atlantic Ocean, and they don't know where they're going to. They're stay. making it up as they go along. Their destination is the, uh, it, it, yeah, is the the Eastern Mediterranean. Ah, uh, yeah, but um. You know, all of this, all of this unbelievable evil that we're seeing, but it really is being, it really is a different, completely different situation than the first, the first time the Israelis toured uh, every hospital in Gaza and destroyed it. Uh, yeah, they just, they wanted a repeat performance for the cameras and they're not, they are not going to get it whatever it is they're going to get is not that. Um, I, I, we should move on to the West Bank uh, because the West Bank also has, I've seen field reports from Tubas, Tulkarem, Janine, Nablus. I mean, everywhere, basically. Yeah. We're seeing IEDs in Bethlehem, yeah. in Hebron, Halil, uh, from the southern tip of the West Bank to the northern tip of the West Bank. Armed struggle, qualitative increase in armed struggle. Um, and some of the communications from uh, Al-Aqsa martyrs brigades, the the armed wing of Hamas and Saraya al-Quds, um, the West Bank, various West Bank town div chapters, divisions of, of al-Quds brigades in, in the West Bank are directly threatening the Palestinian Authority. There was fighting between the Palestinian Authority and resistance groups, right, in Janine? Yeah, so in Janine, there was an assassination yesterday of leaders of the Janine Brigades. 
Um, and then there was uh, at their funeral, the PA opened fire on their funeral. And then some hours later, uh, a col the collaborator that the uh, resistance accused of being the spy was executed. Um, so just a real um, significant turn uh, in the West Bank of it. I mean, and bef and to even to to predate that, um, the the Abbas PA um, Central Committee released a statement saying oh, yeah. that blaming. Hamas for the second Nakba, for bringing yeah, I, on the second Nakba. I addressed that in general terms. I didn't really talk about why I was addressing it. <laughs> I just addressed the idea that Hamas brought all this on to on the people, um, and how that essentially absolves the Israelis of the genocide. Of actual their perpetrators. People. Yeah, it it was a really uh, even in term even in collaborator terms. It's one of the most um, it was an extraordinary statement. And I think I would just say, like, I, I, I would be careful in, and I, th I believe, like, on a show like this, you and I should be very careful about this kind of thing because it's, um, it's because not... people, it's, yeah, it, it's a domestic, it's an intra Palestinian yeah. fight. They'll resolve it however they, they want and however yeah. they choose. But I, um, but I, I, I'll never accept the idea that, um, the resistance brought this on themselves no it's an outrageous statement i don't care who says it i don't care yeah it's an outrageous statement from the guys who who like literally would ride into gaza on the back of an israeli tank it's not just a, a figure of speech yeah. um and the pa was positioning itself to I, I think at some point along those these sit reps we thought that there's maybe the pa was positioning itself um in in a more noble <laughs> slightly more noble uh, way than their collaborator ways. Um, but that's not the case. And the last couple of weeks have really shown that with their statement and then their statement. So there, the PA is, is nominally FATA. Um, as soon as the central committee of the PA made that statement, FATA was the first people to speak out against that statement. FATA fighters saying, um, giving a principled response to how outrageous that statement, how traitorous that statement was, mm -hmm. came from the Fatah party as well. The Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigades, um, the Fatah movement itself made a statement. Um, so yeah, real escalation uh, between the PA um, and even just the PA opening fire in Janine, um, that, that's a very significant event. Yeah. Um, and these both... In some sense, symbolically, both the PA firing on opening fire in Janine and the idea that the Americans are building the pier, these are both signs of a loss of control by the Israeli occupation. They're losing control over their own occupation. They're handing it over to other parties, and the parties they're handing it over to are not up for the job. Uh, no, they're not going to be in Israel's interest. Um, yeah. uh, there's a lot of anger towards the Palestinian Authority. There's no question. Um, so tipping the line from, um, yeah, being a subcontractor of the occupation mm -hmm. to being like actual, yeah. yeah. And I mean, that's that's like that's a very strong position if you are a Zionist to make that position. That, that all of this is Hamas's fault, right? Like for Abbas to right. say that is yeah. it puts him to the right somewhere of, firmly. Yeah, so he's he's somewhere in the middle of the Zionist political yeah. spectrum. It's it's very and, and the timing of it for history to record that timing. It's just it's brutal. Mm. But yeah, significant armed struggle all over the West Bank. Yeah. Um, and and the other thing I want to say about that is just remember that this is not going to stop w whatever happens in Gaza. The Israelis are not going to stop doing things here, and the people are not going to stop fighting back here. So, not in the West is, Bank. No, there's this is no a ceasefire. Palestine, yeah, this is a Palestine-wide issue now. Yeah, 
The yes. occupation is too deeply entrenched in the West Bank to have yeah. a concept like a ceasefire. Yeah. yeah there's no good, there's no ceasefire point. lines in the yeah. integration of Israeli control in the West Bank. And the you know the Israel empowers maniacal settlers to go and commit atrocities. Yeah. Will you can't often. have it? There's no way the resistance can not be in a defensive posture at all times in the West yeah. Bank. So, um, yeah, so the, the Intifada in the West Bank, um, is its, yeah. is its own entirely separate, um, channel. Um, and it's also a source of constant pressure. I mean, we talk about the Hezbollah, Nasrallah talks about how Israel can't many of Israeli forces are tied up in the north because they're worried about Hezbollah. But similarly, a huge chunk of Israel's army is in, tied up dealing with the West Bank, and they can't also deploy to Gaza because of that. Yeah, and and also it runs into all the same problems that they're, the Israelis are having. Like if watching the videos closely from the West Bank, we don't see jeeps anymore. Mm -hmm. They can't go in in their jeeps into the, yeah. the they can't the the nature the the qualitative upgrade of the improvised explosive devices roadside bombs mm -hmm. um, is such that they need their larger armored vehicles they can't just do them in their armored jeeps they can't do them in their Humvees um, they have to do them in bigger vehicles and those vehicles are needed in Gaza where they're getting yeah. blown up. Yeah, well, they've been needed for Rafa, and there's just no indication that the Israelis have that kind of force. And I think that will become more clear mm -hmm. um, as each week passes. I even heard um, the analysis start to sneak into BBC today from um, yeah. former American, like Democratic, um, foreign service officials um, that there that there's actual pushback in the American that this is actually pushback. That's their position that this is actually pushback by the Americans, and that there's talk of of um, you know it 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 escalating to arms embargo stuff, which is obviously could just happen today and the war would end. Yeah. But the fact that even those conversations are happening. And yeah, like we this said before, all... I, I, this peer is not, this peer is the Americans um, saying we something. won't be, yeah. we won't be impotent in the face of this. We will actually do something, 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 something. completely incomprehensible and on a timeline that nobody understands. Uh, but speaking of the Americans who are still in Iraq, the Iraqi resistance, uh, they take a day off now and then, but they've uh, hit They've been trying to hit Ben Gurion Airport, and I also saw a report that they were targeting an electricity station in Tel Aviv. So, expect more ordinance coming from Iraq. Um, the Hezbollah, I mean, just that. Like, if you if you just count the attacks by Hezbollah every day, it's a lot. It's yeah. a lot. Uh, yeah. targeted an Israeli force as it entered the Zarit barracks with artillery shells, targeted a military intelligence force in Matullah settlement, shelled the al Malikia site with artillery, targeted a building in al Malikia, targeted two buildings in Avivim settlements, targeted a building used by Israeli soldiers in the Natua settlement, targeted the Shlomi settlement with rockets, targeted a building used by Israeli soldiers in Zarit's Ramot Naftali settlement, two buildings. So they're just... I mean, it's 10. Yeah, every day. There's no every day off. There's the attacks no are off. from the west, the west to the east, all along the border. Um, yeah. Um, but, and, yeah. And then Ansar Allah had, a couple days ago, another cruise missiles to Eilat. Again, the port, there, Israel's Red Sea port. Israel's defunct Red Sea port, which hasn't been doing anything. Uh, since Ansar Allah started, yeah, and the Israelis admitted that the their drones are getting through to a lot, oh which but they didn't need to admit. Everybody could see. Well, yeah. I, there was some good reporting by um, is it Dimitri Lascaris? Oh, he oh, went. He was in. Song. He was in a lot just uh, just with right? his camera, but it's just showing that it's like a, a ghost town. It looks it's like a ghost town. 
Yeah, it looks like Coney Island when it's closed or whatever, you know, like it's just weird. It's very obviously completely shut down. The leader of um, Ansarullah Abdul Malik Houthi made a speech. I think he does a speech every day because of Ramadan. But he did a speech today, uh, a lot of similar themes to um, Nasrallah's speech last week, where he was just talking about exhaustion. So he said the financial costs of these American ships being here, there's, each ship is spending $2 million per month on food alone, he says. He says they're, oh, they're pampered. They're launching $2 million munitions. Yeah. They're lo- they're sending F F-18s into the sky to not to sh- shoot down yeah. a fifteen hundred dollar drone. <laughs> so he points out he's just like they're pampered. We're used to um we're used to adversity and they're um and then he says he he was kind of complaining that no Arab countries have allowed them the land corridor that they would need to get there. Because they want to go, uh, so I don't know. I, I they'll probably find a way to go, um, and that's gonna be a game changer when that happens. Uh, they also he also pointed out that Alat Port has laid off half of its workers, and so he's he's pointing to all the signs of economic. Oh, man. Trouble. I mean, we didn't ever even get around to the, to Israel, but like it, Israel's yeah. had. More than 50% of its national construction projects completely shut down now going into month six with no end in sight. They're talking about trying to get 200, they need to replace 200,000 Palestinian workers minimum. Mm-hmm. Um, and and their, 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 their attempts to get, you know, South Indians. Asian workers or whatever, it's in batches of like 8,000. And yeah. it takes months and months to coordinate. It's just and um, if they succeed, they're gonna they're gonna end up handing their country over to Indian people, you know. And it's like they have complained already about how it's changing the demographic. The, the in a in a society obsessed with race, race hierarchy and demographics, it's gonna be. I mean, it, what's weirder than having Palestinian workers is having indian workers that are yeah i mean they don't call them palestinians right they call them non-jews non-jews so just as non-jewish if they're from tamil Nadu. or yeah um so uh okay that i now this whole question of exhaustion is is the last thing i wanted to kind of talk about unless you have other news items no. Okay. okay. So I want to talk about exhaustion because I watched um, the EI live stream yesterday, of course, Dr. Ben Thompson uh, and Elon Pape. And Elon Pape ha- said a whole bunch of things that I always go and look for Elon Pape because Elon Pape has this one phrase that I keep listening for, which is like, you know, this is the beginning of the end. And I see signposts as a historian of the that the Zionist project is failing. And he said something in a previous interview about 15 months and on EI, he was a little less specific because I thought there was going to be some event in 15 months that he was looking to. But he said on EI live stream, he said one or two or three years, the short term is a very dangerous time. But if we can get through it, I think the there's hope at the end of this. So that's where he was going. And he said, you know, I don't know how to make it better i don't know how to shorten it but he said basically the more relentless the pressure the better um and the main signs that he said he saw were the lack of so the breakdown of social cohesion in israel and the fact the government doesn't really function and yeah and, and they those... have to make this crucial decision for the budget because the war budget is so significant and they need to recoup all of this. Um, And so the two, the sort of two pillars of the Israeli state that the, that they'll, they'll be secure, um, Mm -hmm. but that they have a welfare state and the budget Netanyahu's war budget cuts into the welfare state already. um, And the way that Israel is behaving is going to require a massive security upgrade um, over the next, you know, several years. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, th- I thought the, the thing- Pape interest was really interesting 
just even about the envelope, right? Like yeah. we, we don't, we have, he talked about the envelope and how that was created after, mm -hmm. you know, to encircle the Gaza Strip and the way that that worked in 1948 and those stories. Um, yeah, just an, unbelievable. He the also, way that they ghettoized people uh, yeah. from Gaza and that there was this two-year window of time where the they didn't know what they were going to do with all yeah. the people. Uh, that That's one part of the... I think people are somewhat aware that the villages that were raided uh, were the where everybody in Gaza is from. Uh, but that sort of interim period of uh, that he talked about was just um, where people were warehoused for that time. It's just, yeah, it's scary stuff when you see what the Egyptians are building on the border, like one of those pens. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, uh, the, the fact that they have the full participation of Egypt and Jordan in this whole genocide is something yeah, else. It is. It's... But um, the other thing he said, he said something also that I really found interesting and I never thought of, which he said, even if they win... Even if they win, what Israel offers to people who live there is constant warfare forever. Mm -hmm. It's like you're gonna just be in at war with everybody, and if you Including win, your own your own society. Because yeah. I mean, I think that was he was sort of talking. He didn't really get into the details about that, but the the mm -hmm. sort of undercurrent was that was the whole previous year before October seventh, when there was basically a civil yeah. war um, in their parliament in their body politique mm -hmm. um that's basically cut, like a split right down the middle right yeah um in a Absolutely. in a way that yeah the war put on the back burner but yeah not, not so, forever so there's this paper john that all the pro russia i mean it's it's an anti-russian paper it's by a by a think tank, a UK think tank. But the UK think tank is trying to argue that the Western armies are not ready for a war with Russia and they don't understand how Russia fights war. And it was this paper, I don't know if you saw it, but it's called The Attritional Art of War. And it's by a, a group called RUSI. I don't know what I don't know what RUSI stands for, but I know it's a UK military think tank. And so their argument is, okay, Western armies think in terms of maneuver. You you mass your troops, you maneuver, and you use these maneuvers to get into territory, and you've occupied territory, and you um, have created a, you know, a, basically a, a territorial control situation where your enemy can't, you know, do anything anymore. And then, th then you've won the war. So you've captured enough key territory to win the war through mass maneuver of, of military forces. But he says there's another way to think about war, which is the way the Russians think about war, which is you you slowly but surely destroy the fighting ability of your opponent. And so he's he's arguing that in modern in you know the current configuration of of warfare and weapons the attritional method is more effective than the maneuver method because it's easier to mass fires he says some, somewhere here like it's easier to to create a lot of firepower than it is to to put a whole bunch of troops together which then become a target for that kind of firepower so you know he's, he's talking about russia but there's this there's this um, interesting thing in the end of the second paragraph where he says, the attritional nature of combat, including the erosion of professionalism due to casualties, levels the battlefield, no matter which army started with better trained forces. As conflict drags on, the war is won by economies, not armies. States that grasp this and fight such a war via attritional strategy aimed at exhausting enemy resources while preserving their own are more likely to win. The fastest way to lose a war of attrition is to focus on maneuver, expending valuable resources on near-term territorial objectives. Recognizing that wars of attrition have their own art is vital to winning them without 
sustaining crippling losses. And I just thought this is actually very pertinent to the way that the resistance is fighting Israel. And he talks a lot about, he says like German panzers were better than the Soviet tanks, but Soviet tanks cost eight, eight times less. So like there were eight Soviet tanks for every panzer. And then you think of like the doctrine that you've been talking about of the Yassins or the Al Ghul rifles where like we make lots of them. Everybody had every, you know, we train lots of people to use them. And, and the uh, more of them you have, the bigger your army. Actually, he says that here. He gets. says it is easier and faster to produce large numbers of cheap weapons and munitions. New recruits also absorb simpler weapons faster, allowing rapid generation of new formations or the reconstitution of existing ones. So all of these things do relate to the Palestinian resistance as well. The strategic wisdom of the Yassin mm -hmm. is is just remarkable, especially coming out of the the July War in Lebanon. Like the sort of understanding was that you would have these sophisticated anti tank weapon systems, um, and that's that that's the direction that that the war was going. Um, and when that it, it looked like everything was pointing towards doing that, Kassam at basically the same time made this decision that that's not where they're going to put their energy. Mm -hmm. um, and, and just the way that it's uh, unfolded, it's just really remarkable. Um, then, then there's the tunnels. So when he talks about Russia, so he says, you know, military operations in a nutritional conflict are different. Um, and, you don't want to do this big blitzkrieg kind of maneuver where you penetrate deep into the enemy's territory because then you're unprotected by your air defense, you're unprotected by all of these uh, resources that are kind of defensive that protect you from enemy firepower. And then you're, the thing that you just punched into can be destroyed. A layered bubble of friendly protective systems while stretching depleted enemy reserves. So in, you know, the Palestinians don't have layered air defense, but they have the tunnels. So they don't attack far from the tunnels. Um, but when the Israelis reach out and are sitting over the tunnel network is when the Israelis are vulnerable to attritional, um, attritional reduction in their, in their military. Um, and then, he says, you know, there's there's a second phase of attritional warfare when one side is exhausted, which is when you then attack all along the line, shallow attacks, he says, across a broad front, front seeking to overwhelm the enemy at multiple points with shallow attacks. So, I mean, if this... We'll see. <laughs> we'll see where it goes. But, I mean, there are also analogies in terms of the way that um the resistance you know has gone on the offensive in some cases and that is what they do they do shallow attacks all over the place um just the number of fighters that they're creating by this yeah. way of war yeah um i just it's yeah they're they're setting themselves up um uh, for a couple of generations of really fierce unforgive like people that just won't forgive yeah um yeah and i i don't i i mean they're trying to address that by extermination but i don't think so they're killing an unbelievable amount of people Every single day, they're killing more than 100 people, even the days that aren't in the news. I mean, I don't know. There's, I listened to CBC today in Canada, our national broadcaster. The Shifa, Shifa wasn't on the news. It's not on the news. No, I mean, that, this is how they maintain <laughs> this is how they maintain their support for Israel. They just ignore all the evidence of the worst things that Israel does. So they just, you know, if there's some... There's some incident like the Al Ahli Hospital, which they're still arguing about today. Meanwhile, we have three more month, four more months, five more months of atrocities that they're just ignore. They just ignore. 
like it just never happened you can you can tell a canadian politician about it their eyes just glaze over it just passes over them yeah i mean i think there used to be this thing in the media where where they would overwhelmingly cover other things but that that there was at least an understanding that that it would be recorded for history mm -hmm. in some way even if you told the story incorrectly or framed it with only israeli spokespeople um, but that that if you were to reach into the archive for what will be one of the you know moments that historians study of this Shifa attack, um, that you would at least want to be on record having at some point said something about it. You can kind of see that in the New York Times, right? Like they they do they do mention these things at some point along the line. Like the New York Times just did a story the other day about the the work crews that are trying to get the telecommunications network back up, right? Six months. That was a story that should have been done six, five and a half months ago when Israel knocked out the communications and these people were just as heroic as they are today. Um, but But by the time they cover it, it's not significant in the in the in the public discourse, but if you were to go back and search their database, right? Like if you were to search the New York Times database for the Second Intifada, you would see disproportionately uh, military focused coverage, but you would see in the newspaper articles that people that the Second Intifada began because Israel was sniping people in the head that people are being massacred um with in with purposeful shots um but this this that seems in, it's at least, in canadian gone. media it's completely gone they don't yeah. feel any need to be recording for history these events i don't i don't i don't know i don't i think it's gone everywhere i think what the new york times is doing is a different game altogether i think they're it's it's just part of the war it's just yeah. part of what they're doing. All right. Well, um, we, yeah, there's just, there's so much to watch with, uh, especially with Shifa, like we'll be back maybe tomorrow or the next day. Cause this is just, this is an, un, this is a, this is history. Like this is an uh, unbelievable thing that we are, are witnessing. And yeah. uh, the last 48 hours, the 72 hours have been uh, unbelievable. But like, how how is this going to end? Like, the the resistance is going to continuously attack the Israelis that are attacking Al Shifa. So, at some point, the Israelis are going to call the raid off, or they're going to, or it's going to turn into like the battle of the entire war, where they're just going to keep yeah. pouring fight, pouring yeah. Israeli army into there, and then the resistance. Yeah. Like, there's just... tens of thousands. I would, yeah. I would go on record saying there's tens of thousands of fighters in the north yeah so that i mean yeah. either either this is going to escalate into a gigantic battle or the israelis are going to withdraw again and try to get ready for the attack on rafa but those are the if there's a third possibility maybe I, i've missed it but we either whatever it is we'll we'll be here to talk about it next time so like and subscribe and stuff like that and we'll see you in the next one See you guys.